Hi, I'm Laura Lorick, founder of Silicon Hills News in Austin, Texas. And today I have the pleasure to interview Alex Rodriguez, co-founder and CEO of Embark Trucks. Awesome. Hi, Laura. Thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, it's really exciting to be here. My name is Alex Rodriguez, uh, co-founder and CEO of Embark. I've been doing robotics for 15 years, built the first self-driving vehicle to operate on public roads in Canada. And then for the last six years, we've been running uh, the longest running self-driving truck program in the United States with Embark. And I'm really excited to come here and uh, talk about supply chain and self-driving and how we're going to use technology to make everyone's lives faster and safer. And Embark has achieved a lot of firsts. You guys were the first self-driving truck company to do an autonomous coast-to-coast -coast drive, the first to reach 100,000 miles driven on public roads, and the first to open a network of transfer points. So can you tell us about Embark? How does the business model work? Yeah. So yeah, maybe I'll explain how self-driving trucks operate, and then we can jump into sort of how Embark uh, fits into that. Uh, the idea behind self-driving trucks is it's taking the same autonomy technology that maybe you've heard of for self-driving cars, um, but we think uh, there's actually a much better business model uh, in the commercial space. And the reason we're able to do that is you actually take these long runs. So for example, Embark uh, will actually do a lot of uh, testing in Texas. We have, uh, you could so think for example about LA to Dallas. So LA, Dallas, it's over a thousand miles and you break it up into three. So instead of having one truck go all the way, you have a local driver in LA that does the first mile and a local driver in Dallas that does the last mile. And then they're dropping off the trailer uh, sort of at the edge of the city. And you have a driverless truck that's basically going on the highway from one end all the way to the other. And so that sort of breaking it up into three allows the software we're developing to focus specifically on highway driving uh, and dealing with that sort of long, boring stretch of driving that happens between the cities. Um, and that's really well suited to what the, the robotics technology is good at today versus really complex inner city driving where we're just passing it off uh, to, to that local driver. So that's how a self-driving truck works. Embark specifically is a software developer. So we started back in 2016 before anybody else who's in the space. And what we did was uh, really focus on building world-class machine learning and perception modules to be able to understand and plan ahead. And then we work together with some of the biggest fleets in the country. So we work with uh, Knight Swift and DHL uh, as two of our partners. And then we uh, also work with the manufacturing players. Uh, so we don't build trucks, we, we partner on that front. We don't operate trucks, we partner on that front. What we do is build a software package uh, that enables all of that. And the software package, it, there's, it rides aboard the truck. And how does the technology work? Are you using sensors, uh, radar? How does it detect the cars, the obstacles in the road, that kind of thing when it's on the, the actual highway? Yeah, so you have, uh, you have cameras. You have what are called LIDAR, which are 3D scanner sensors that give you really precise location information. Uh, and then we have radar and we have GPS. And so we actually have, in some sense, a lot more different ways of understanding the world than a person does when they're sitting and driving a truck and they obviously only have two eyes. Uh, and so one of the, the, the way the technology works, it starts with those four different sensor modalities. It's seeing the world 360 degrees around. So we have sensors facing forward, at the same time, we have sensors that are always checking your blind spot and looking over your shoulder. And you fuse that together to create one unified view of the world. And one of the things that's pretty cool about self-driving tech is that we can be tracking uh, the car behind us in a merge and also the car over to our left and also the car 500 meters up ahead all at the same time using 360 degree views from multiple sensors. And Embark has recently a, a launched a line that goes from Houston to San Antonio. Can you talk a little bit about that? The, these trucks are actually on the road now, right? Yeah, that's right. So we have uh, a development fleet of trucks that we uh, operate to move commercial freight with the system in self-driving mode. And so uh, the goal for that fleet is to really put the system through its paces. We don't want to just be developing it in a lab or in a simulator. Um, we want to actually 
make sure that it works for real customers and real freight. And so we have a fleet of trucks. Um, yeah, last year, uh, we expanded. So we, we've historically been focused in California and Arizona. And then last year, we expanded to Texas. Uh, and so we opened up uh, a site in Houston and also a lane that runs from Houston to San Antonio. Uh, and we're really excited about it. I think te Texas is an amazing place to be uh, working for driverless technology, uh, both because there's a really big freight market, uh, obviously Texas Triangle, huge freight market. Um, and at the same time, there's a, a really great partnership with Texas Department of Transportation. Uh, and we work also with uh, Texas A&M. Uh, and so being able to work with um, some of those government and academic groups to actually get trucks on the road has been been really great. So where are we today with this technology? You're talking about you're in Arizona, California, and Texas, but how long until the AV technology rolls out across the nation? And what is that going to look like? Yeah, so I think what's really important to understand is that uh, this is something that is going to be incremental. Um, and so people sometimes try and think about what would happen if you flipped a light switch and every truck in the country was self-driving. Uh, but the reality is that's not how it's going to work. So you mentioned we're, we're sort of in three states right now. Uh, we'll be expanding to cover the U.S. Sun Belt uh, in 2024. So that'll be um, pretty much all the, the southern parts of the country where you don't see it snow that frequently. Uh, and then expanding to the rest of the country in 2026. And so you're going to see that incremental growth uh, piece by piece as we add lanes and add, uh, add new state-level state, state level deployments. And I think that... Um, it, you're going to continue to see, in fact, a growing trucking industry and more trucking jobs uh, over the next five, 10 years. Um, but what you're going to see also is that there'll be more local jobs. And so some portion of uh, the total freight routes are going to start to have that, that partnership with local drivers who are sleeping in their, their bed in the same city, uh, and then the driverless truck that's going back and forth between them. Uh, but it's going to be many years uh, sort of to see that transition happen in full. And let's talk about the drivers, because there is a driver shortage right now. The great resignation has made it evident that we are, uh, people have retired in a lot of these jobs. And, and how is that driver relationship going to evolve? Because from what you're saying, you still need a driver to take it through the city, because those are more complex routes going through metro areas than it is going from city to city on a highway. So there's always going to be need, a need for a driver. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I, I think um, there's there's always going to be a need for a driver. We actually think there's going to be more drivers hired in, in the coming years to help fill this demand. Um, and it's not just, I think I would say two things, right? On, on the one hand, it's that complex downtown metro driving. And it's also the customer service aspect. So there's, you're actually arriving, doing the pickup, the drop off, the loading, unloading, inspection, paperwork. There's a lot of pieces that are happening at that endpoint. And what we're really trying to do is take the very consistent, long, boring driving that happens in the middle and be able to take that piece out and then have your local drivers focus more on uh, the things that are more complex and more customer specific. And I think if you look at the economy today, people are really starting to recognize how important drivers are and how the demographics haven't really been keeping up with the demand. Um, something that's maybe less well known is that most uh, truck drivers are sitting above the average age of the overall working population, uh, and you're getting fewer and fewer younger drivers in. And so we've known this for many years. Um, it's something that everyone else is starting to realize as you see the supply chain shortage, that it's just not sustainable to have one cohort of drivers moving all the nation's freight indefinitely as they start to retire. And so I see bringing in new drivers um, at the same time as we deploy this uh, autonomy technology is really being um, the path forward to unlock American supply chains. And look, can we talk a little bit about the safety, the efficacy, and the cost reduction involved when you use autonomous trucks? What are some of the, can you talk about the potential benefits of having this on our highways? Yeah, so oh, I, I think there are, it, there are a number of really big benefits, right? The first one that people think about is, is the efficiency. So a driver is limited to 11 hours a day and going across the country takes at least four days based on that limitation. Uh, an autonomous truck 
can go coast to coast in uh, a little over one day. You're able to take that and really compress it down to um, just a little bit more than one day. And so that ends up being hugely valuable for produce or for medical supplies uh, or really anything that you want to be able to deliver quickly. Being able to run 24-7 is hugely beneficial. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing is that you're able to have a, a minimize the environmental impact. We're able to operate, because you're operating 24-7, you're not stopping idling overnight. Uh, we're able to drive a lot more smoothly uh, instead of stopping and starting. And we're able to save quite a bit of fuel on these deliveries, which is pretty exciting. And then safety. Uh, the technology that, that we're building it has 360 degree attention. It's never getting tired. It's never getting distracted. Uh, and that allows us to address a significant majority of all accidents where there is an element of, uh, of human error. And really by being able to take that human error out, uh, we, we hope to be able to address uh, thousands of road fatalities a year that are coming from heavy truck accidents. And then finally, quality of life for the, the driver population allowing people to stay in a single city, which is by far the most desirable type of trekking job. And so you really see every aspect of the logistics industry ends up being improved, whether that's the efficiency, whether it's environmental impact, whether that's safety, or whether it's the quality of life for the people who actually work in the industry. I think this is going to be easily the biggest transformation since deregulation. And can you talk about how you're working with the fleets and how, how are you going to get them to start adopting the AV technology that you're creating? Yeah, we've seen really huge excitement from the fleets for all four of those reasons I just mentioned, right? They care about uh, safety, sustainability, efficiency, and driver quality of life, um, probably you know the, more than anybody. Um, and we've seen some of the biggest fleets in the nation really leaning forward on this. So I mentioned we're already partnered with uh, folks like Knight Swift, which is the largest truckload carrier in the United States, DHL, which is one of the largest, uh, one of the largest LTL delivery groups, um, and a bunch of other big fleets, Warner Enterprises, Bison, Messia Valley. So we've really selected a number of, of top fleets in the United States to work with. Um, and uh, we're, they're already leaning in very aggressively. So we have uh, over 14,000 reservations for our software from uh, those fleets uh, that they're going to be deploying starting in 2024 when we do that nationwide rollout. Uh, and so I think uh, in, in some sense, what we're seeing is really, um, it's not so much going out and finding people that are interested, it's actually figuring out how we're going to manage all that demand. And in November of 2021, Embark became a publicly traded company listing on the NASDAQ under the symbol EMBK. And through this process, you became the youngest CEO of a publicly traded company, which is really exciting. So can you tell us what's next for Embark and what are the remaining challenges that you're addressing? Yeah, that was, it was super exciting. Um, I think it's a, really, it, it's a really cool opportunity from our perspective. Um, to get to interact on equal footing with a lot of these customers that uh, are very large established brands and expect us to have the same level of uh, uh, the same level of uh, disclosure and and stability um, that you see from from a public company, and so we see that as a really big step for the business, um, and it's been really helpful in, in convincing some of the top fleets in the country that. This is a brand they can believe in, that Embark is something they should be investing alongside. Um, and the next big step for us is uh, going from the commercial small-scale deliveries we do right now with our internal fleet and transitioning that to move that into some of the biggest fleets in the country. And so between now and 2024, uh, we have, we're going to be very busy. Uh, we're, we're getting fleet trucks in the hands of fleets very soon. Uh, and continuing to make sure that we have all the right pieces of software in place so that you can actually operate those trucks safely without needing to have someone inside the truck when you're on a highway. Alex, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into robotics? I understand you built your first robot at the age of 11. Can you talk about how you got into this industry? Yeah, I think uh, robotics is one of those industries that's very young, right? If you go back to the very first effort in self-driving started in 2007. And so uh, pretty much everybody 
uh, is really grappling with these same problems and figuring out how to, to bring robots online in real time. Uh, and then that's kind of cool. And it's a, it, it means that um, there's an opportunity for uh, folks like myself to really step in and uh, bring new innovations. M my story begins, I was uh, 11 years old in Canada uh, and got into competitive robotics. Uh, and that really um, is where I got the opportunity to experience um, the full development cycle from ideation all the way to development and then uh, taking these robots into competition. Uh, and I think we learned a great deal. I won a robotics world championship uh, when I was uh, still in grade school. I mentored and led a couple of teams uh, over the years. And that really led a lot of uh, the learnings that then went into our first, uh, what was a self-driving golf cart, the first self-driving vehicle in Canada. Uh, and then ultimately, after a couple more self-driving systems, uh, we eventually starting Embark. And how did you go into trucks and not, uh, could you go from golf carts? Why did you go into cars? Why trucks? Why the pick that industry? I think that's really the key inside of Embark. I mentioned at the beginning, Embark is the longest running self-driving truck program in the United States. And what really separates us from other players is we've long recognized that one of the things that's needed to be successful is focus. Embark is a lot more capital efficient than anybody else attempting self-driving. And a big part of why we've been able to do that is we identified where is there a real opportunity and what can we not do? That's a question we're always asking. Uh, and so I think you could do cars, you could do uh, shuttles alongside trucks. We sat at the beginning of the business and said, what can we not do that's gonna allow us to get this technology to market faster. Um, and by focusing, we're not doing the metropolitan driving, we're not doing multiple vehicle classes, uh, we're able to really focus on the things that matter. And that's really great driving for class A trucks on highways. Um, and that's also something we see a lot of appreciation from our partners for. So when we're sitting down with big fleets, they um, are excited to see a product that's built specially for trucks and not uh, something that, that was designed initially for cars. And I also understand you were a Teal Fellowship recipient and that you went through the Y Combinator in uh, Silicon Valley. How were those experiences? How did they help shape what you're doing today? Yeah, so uh, my story starts off in Canada. Then myself and my co-founder, Brandon, uh, got went to University of Waterloo, studied mechatronics engineering, and then came down uh, to San Francisco. And uh, we've had the unique privilege of really getting to interact with some of the best investors and uh, company builders in the world, um, whether that's the Teal Fellowship, Y Combinator, uh, Sequoia Capital, uh, and being able to work with these folks, I think has been really valuable, especially as relatively young founders. Um, you know, I know a lot about robotics, uh, but it's been hugely valuable as we build the business um, to be able to lean on folks who've seen uh, this story play out before, know what it takes to, to hire executives, to be successful with partners. Um, and uh, one of the crazy stats I heard recently is that um, one of our investors is actually in a, in a backer of 25% of the market cap of the NASDAQ. Uh, and so to have that level of experience in your, in your boardroom is, is hugely helpful. And where you're at, Silicon Valley, that's the heartbeat of the AV technology industry that is developing, that's rolling out, going to be global eventually. Isn't it the, the place yeah. to be right now? Next to Texas. Yeah. You're going to move to Texas eventually. <laughs> so actually, I, like a lot of the software engineers live in Silicon Valley. A lot of the testing is happening in Texas and Arizona. Um, and so it really is. Um, I would say those three areas are the crown jewels of the U.S. autonomy industry. Uh, and I think it's pretty cool. This is um, obviously going to be one of the core innovations over the next decade or so. And America is absolutely leading the way um, out of uh, some of the, the amazing teams that we have across California, Arizona, and Texas. Thank you so much, Alex. Thanks for joining us today for Move America Chat. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me.